um, went on to do wonderful things, and so we uh, invited him to speak here about the influence really a very personal influence on his life, had in uh, North America in terms of sustainability uh, developments. And so with no further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Ari Novi. Thank you, uh, Nick, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And um, it's really an honor to be here. Um, um, I was a student at, at New York University in the late 90s. Uh, I came and worked here at Villa La Pietra um, in the Office of Student Life for a year and a half, and then I left, and then I came back as a gardener for a year um, in, at La Pietra, and then I, um, I did see the light, thanks to Nick. Um, Nick has been a very important figure in my life, um, and decided that I should study plants, um, because they're really interesting. My, my major at NYU was actually Italian, so it was a big shift. Um, so, uh, Nick and I didn't talk about this at all, but I, I, I had planned on talking about <laughs> exactly the things that Nick just mentioned. Um, and so, you know, in many ways, I, I, I'm, I'm an unusual person to be here because um, uh, it's not often that you have the, the honor of speaking um, amongst a group of folks um, for whom you have their books on your shelf. And several of the people here speaking today, I do have their books on my shelf, and you'll see a couple of them because I'm going to quote them. But, um, I, I, I did see the light while I was studying Italian here, you know, here at a villa, and I saw that plants were um, incredibly important, and um, it led me um, down a pretty deep rabbit hole, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to help figure out where that comes from. So um, my current job is I'm, I'm the executive director of the United States Botanic Garden, um, which is a, an arm of the United States Congress, believe it or not. Um, it's the oldest um, botanical garden in, in North America, which is not very old by U.S. standards. We're only from 1842. Um, but it's, it's it, not very old by, sorry, by international standards, but, but pretty old by American standards. And um, our mission is to educate and demonstrate the value of plants to the well-being of humankind. It's a very broad educational mandate. Um, we're not a research institution, but I do hold a research appointment um, as well at the Smithsonian Institution in the Department of Botany. Um, and so... <clears throat> Uh, let me just mention my outline quickly before I move on. Uh, um, I'm going to say a few more things about myself. I, I guess I get to do that, um, uh, which is not that comfortable, actually, for scientists. I eventually became a scientist, and they beat that out of you. Um, or at least they make you hide it a little bit more in statistics and other things. Um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, how we think about sustainability, mainly in a contemporary scientific context, um, uh, about maybe how Tuscan villas fit into that, and then uh, drill down a little bit specifically with what that means um, with re in regard to the Tuscan villa, um, and then pull it out into a, a more global um, uh, and American example with agriculture. And uh, it's interesting that this is ending up being an agriculture conference. Um, I think that's really, really apropos. Um, that's, that's proper. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the crossroads that we're at, which, um, which we already heard about earlier. In fact, I think I'm going to recycle quite a bit of things people have already said and talk about some challenges and opportunities and conclusions. Um, so that's me uh, driving a vehicle. I don't think I ruined any statues with this particular vehicle, maybe with some other ones. Um, and I loved being a gardener here at Villa La Pietra. And I grew up in a farming community in, in New Jersey, believe it or not, in the Garden State. Um, the western part of New Jersey, where, where it was the breadbasket of the, of the Revolutionary War, believe it or not. Most of the grains consumed by the Continental Army were grown in the, in the county that I grew up in. But um, I was not a farmer. I was not in Future Farmers of America. Uh, it was at a time when, if, if you um, could excel in science, you were told to go into engineering um, or, or, or finance or be a lawyer. My mother would have liked that. Um, but nonetheless, I studied Italian. I think that was my way of, of rebelling and, uh, um, and got a job amazingly here and then found a love for plants. And um, I, I, I've found that I can give my biography in terms of plants. Um, and so um, the, it absolutely starts at Villa La Pietra um, with the plants and the landscape that, um, that really made me feel at home and made me wonder what makes plants grow. Um, it was less the design aspects of, of the villa that were as interesting to me as the living organisms that make up its matrix. Uh, and so I went off, uh, in, in fact, on Nick's advice, Nick said, you've got these things in the U.S. called land-grant colleges. And I think I was about 23 at the time, and I said, what are those? <laughs> Having gone to NYU, which is not a land-grant college, well, those are the 
um, uh, mostly um, public institutions, um, public state universities within the United States that have been the centers of agricultural education and, and research um, since the late 1800s. They were a great um, an invention um, of the Congress under President Lincoln, believe it or not, and expanded upon in many different times, um, including into the, into the current day. And he said, you might want to check out one of those land-grant colleges. They have things you're interested in. And so I ended up at the land-grant college in my home state, which is Rutgers University. Um, and there I, I became an evolutionary ecologist. Um, so I actually, as, a, as an academic, I study the way genetic information in little tiny molecules that I'll never actually view with my own eyes moves at the landscape level and what the consequences are for those things in conserving endangered species like the beautiful swamp pink, which is native to uh, much of the eastern United States but is federally uh, endangered. Um, resurrected species like the Dawn Redwood, a plant that was thought to have been extinct, um, known only from the fossil record and then discovered in a couple of valleys in China in the uh, 1940s. Um, as well as um, complex ecosystems. These are eastern um, marsh grass systems um, of the eastern United States. Uh, this was actually a project I did at Jamaica Bay, Queens. So if you've ever flown into JFK, you've flown over one of my research sites and probably never noticed it. Um, and then looking at how evolution happens during range expansion. This is a, an invasive grass in the United States called Japanese stiltgrass um, that's native to eastern Asia and has become a very serious in environmental weed of forested systems in the eastern United States. And this was my laboratory for a long time and my sort of natural state of being. Uh, and then I graduated and got a PhD and realized I needed to make a living. And so I found myself with a job in this garden um, that sits underneath the United States Capitol. And I was at first in charge of education there and then eventually promoted to, um, to, to the deputy executive director and, and very recently executive director. And there I find myself um, occupied less with these sort of natural systems and, and, and organisms out in the, in the landscape just doing what they're doing, kind of moving around however animals and, and the plants themselves can get themselves around, but thinking more about the built la um, landscape and the context of the built landscape. Um, the U.S. Botanic Garden is a founding partner of the Sustainable Sites Initiative for the landscape architects in the room. Um, this is basically LEED for landscapes. It was founded on that very concept. It's the leading um, certification program for sustainability in the built landscape. And we also have, have uh, our partners for this, I should really acknowledge them, are the American Society for Landscape Architecture, as well as the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, um, which is housed at the University of of Texas at Austin. And, um, and we've also, together with our University of Texas collaborators, developed a program called Landscapes for Life, which essentially distills this very highly technical um, design system um, into homeowner language so that those who would like to maintain um, landscapes, um, ornamental or otherwise, they don't have to just be ornamental landscapes, can, um, can, can design according to some of the principles of sustainability. So I've I've become steeped in sustainability, and I've become steeped in the sustainability of the built landscape. And in very interesting ways, it's brought me back sort of full circle to, um, to, the, to the villa um, and the villa environment in Tuscany that got me first in, interested in plants. Um, because ultimately, plants are really only useful to humans if they're useful to humans. Uh, who cares about swamp pink? Yeah, it's real pretty if I go look at it in the pine, pine lands of New Jersey for about the two weeks that it blooms, but what's its function in the ecosystem? Is it an indicator species? Does it clean water? Is there an animal that I care about, like that I want to hunt or eat or stare at because I'm an ornithologist that, 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 that cares for it? Um, well, it's ants and flies that like this plant. Or do we have any big ant or fly people in the room? Any entomologists in the room? Um, who cares? Some people might, not a lot of people do. And uh, we'll see what that means, hopefully. Um, so I want to introduce sustainability and, and how it's thought of today, at least in, in, in a scientific and uh, regulatory capacity. Um, philosophically, um, and, and I don't think the scientific community nor the regulatory community think very philosophically, but it's important to recognize that there was a philosophy at one point that informed um, the pragmatic thinking that they later adopted. Philosophically, sustainability is simply to utilize no resources that cannot be regenerated, um, that can be thought of diagrammatically as a closed loop. Um, you don't consume anything that you don't regenerate. If you think about that for a second, I think you'll think how very far from that we, we are. Um, and so pragmatically, because we are so far away from any kind of a true closed loop, um, we think in terms of a three-pronged approach to sustainability. Um, and those approaches are, uh, and this was mentioned earlier, the social, the environmental, and then the economic. Um, sometimes they're called different names, social, cultural, economic is usually economic. 
uh, there's so many ways to parse that word. Uh, environmental is sometimes scientific, environmental, um, biological diversity, all different words kind of get put in there. And it's interesting to look how this Venn diagram intersects, where social and environmental come together, we've got bearable, where, we're, where environmental and economic come together, we've got viable, and where we've got economic and social, we've got equitable. Um, and where they all come together, we've got sustainable. Um, and I'm going to unpack this a little bit more because these things get very, very complex, especially when you enumerate them and you start to think of them um, because they need to be rubricized for policymakers because that's the way policymakers function in order to provide equitability, as ugly and boring and bureaucratic as it may be, it's sometimes necessary. Um, so in practice, um, these are the kind of things we think about. We think about the environment and ecosystems in terms of ecosystem services, and they're usually thought of in terms of very large scale interconnected systems that operate on multiple spatial scales, and ideally, they should be quantifiable, and if not quantifiable, at least somewhat rigorously qualifiable. Um, and this is because of the need to, to, we're talking about public expenditure in many of these cases, we're talking about laws, we're talking about equitability, and so there is a need to create a system where verification is possible that the intended goals are met. The economic systems typically think about profitability and access to that economic system. Uh, and then the social systems are human health and well-being, cultural expression, and freedom. Freedom is a loaded word. Freedom of choice is often um, sort of the way things are thought about. Am I a farmer? Am I allowed to choose that I'm going to plant soybeans or I'm going to plant um, a polycultural um, um, sustainable farm? Do I have that choice? And what's behind it? So what about Italian villas? Um, I really think it's so apropos that this um, meeting is a little bit turning into a agriculture um, conversation. And um, Emilio Sereni, um, who, who, as mentioned earlier, was the father, um, uh, at least in the, in the modern era, of thinking about Italian agricultural landscapes, um, wrote a, a seminal book in 1961, The History of the Italian Agricultural Landscape. Um, and in that book, he said, villas are a part of the continuum of agricultural development of Italy from classical to contemporary times. So in his analysis, the villa, and he enumerated the types of villas and the times that they, they, they existed, was, was an agricultural landscape. It's a, a part of the agricultural continuum of activity here in Italy. Um, this is translated into English. It's a real must, I think, for people who are interested in this topic. Um, please read it. Um, Litchfield translated it and was published in uh, 1997 and then was reprinted um, just, I think, two years ago in 2012. So you can, you can order this now from Princeton University Press. And Litch, Litchfield's um, summary was that Sereni uh, uh, conceived of agriculture as a practical, active, reasoned response, which often emerged amongst the cultivators themselves, but was reflected in the basic processes and implications of the technology to the problems posed by the materials and economic environment of the rural landscape. He pretty much got all three of those prongs of sustainability that we talk about now before anybody was even talking about that. So, this history, this, this thought process of, of, of Sereni's thought process of thinking about the Italian landscape is very, very contiguous with the thought process that we evoke today in a more general way for sustainability. He specifically wrote about the Bel Paesaggio Italian style villa, um, which is, is probably where La Pietra would fall, at least in its original inception. Um, and he wrote, the Tuscan peasant or artisan of the Renaissance could thus put into the care of this row of vines or avenue of cypresses and other um, aspects of care of the villa, all the taste and capacity for artistic creation that had developed within him. But the landscape remained essentially for others, for the privileged classes. He was steeped in communist philosophy. Um, he was an important member of the Communist Party in Italy, um, which of course, if you're talking about the post-war period, um, was, was, was a very, very strong reaction against fascism, and so that's very, very important. And, and some of the populism that's reflected in his um, view of of, of, of the peasant farmer, the contadino, um, through Italian agricultural history certainly was informed um, by that, but it's also somewhat um, comparable to some of the, the, the populist views that we see um, today coming about as well. So he sees the Bel Paisaggio period as a uh, freedom of expression improving a little bit for the workers on the farms, but to a point, certainly better than in the medieval. Um, he also recognized that changes were afoot, and he quite poetically, literally, um, quoted the poet um, Luigi Tansilo in his chapter on um, Bel Paisaggio Villas um, from his poem, Il, po Il, Il Podere, I guess you can translate the Podere's farm, but it doesn't quite work. Um, 
Uh, and he said, uh, uh, Tanzilu said, I don't want villas, right? So these are people thinking about what are villas going to mean? What are they going to be in the Renaissance? I don't want villas to be places of a cumbersome type or to have visitors see land that is less plowed than swept. There's an importance of maintaining the agricultural aspect of the villa. And that can probably be e e most easily summarized in, in Sereni's line, um, also from his book, um, about the importance of balance in the villa between utility and pleasure. And he specifically um, utilized the Uten's plate of Villa Medici in Cafagiolo um, as an example um, of, of a very, very good transition point where you have a um, relatively medieval style castle, um, but around it you have really th this great idea of the Bel Paisaggio landscape where there are agricultural lands within and without and then a formal landscape. Um, we see the south facing um, Limonaya, um, you know, which itself is agricultural and ornamental at the same time. Um, and so this is really uh, an excellent visual example of what we see here. And I think Villa La Pietra, which of course, um, you know, its first incarnation approximately would have been the Sassetti family in 1460, later the Caponi family from 1490 on, and a few other Italian families intervening, and then the Caron era with the Actons in 1908 and NYU in 1994, is certainly a landscape that had its beginning in that time period. It has changed. There have been, like many other um, um, landscapes, some Baroque um, concepts and other things that, that were added on here, but um, it's, at its core, it is an agricultural landscape um, mixed with utility and with pleasure, as I think a lot of people have really been um, talking about. Keeping in mind this context and recognizing that we're on a continuum of important Italian thought processes, um, let's drill down a little bit more on sustainability. And let's recognize that the Italian tradition of thinking about the Italian agricultural landscape is entirely compatible and in line with the way we think about sustainability today. I went over this a little bit before, and so I'm not gonna spend much time on it, but let's drill down here a little bit further. And I'll start with the easy ones. Um, social, so social. Um, I don't know, you really can't see this, but what's the NYU motto? motto? Anybody can read that? All you NYU students in here, Latin scholars. Per, sta, per stare et prestare. Yeah. Who knows what it means? Per stare. To preserve and to excel. Um, and then, uh, of course, NYU carrying the torch, symbolizing both the torch of knowledge, but also symbolizing um, the um, service of the university specifically to... Who's holding this torch? What does that look like? I'll give you a hint. It's a statue... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, it references the location of New York University originally. NYU's current motto, or, or part of its mission statement, it's got a long mission statement, I didn't know that, is th thriving beyond borders and across academic disciplines. NYU has emerged as one of the most networked and extensive worldwide platforms for learning, teaching, researching, building knowledge, and inter uh, inventing new ways to meet humanity's challenges. Um, I would say that having a university-owned and, and maintain a, a, a villa like this and the environs certainly um, would, would, would meet the criteria for sustainability on many of the social um, areas. Human health, if you walk up and down the path from Villa Uliva to Villa Natalia at least twice a day, I think you're good. Um, so <laughs> um, I think that, that there's a high score if we're gonna score things on this one. Um, but value to the community is an interesting thing because then you start to get into questions of who's the community, what's the identity? And I don't know that I'm qualified to answer that question anymore as a, not a member of the NYU community right now, but it's an interesting question. One of the other aspects of sustainability, of course, is economic sustainability. Um, and I certainly have no insight as to whether or not NYU views this as an economically sustainable enterprise. Um, um, if I was one of the customers here, I used to be a customer, if you'll let me use that parlance, um, it's a question I might be interested in. But I think, suffice to say, NYU is not having economic problems. <clears throat> so the really interesting um, uh, prong of sustainability, I think, for our conversation, at least for me, I am a natural scientist, is the environmental, um, which are primarily conceived of as ecosystem services. Um, and they are generally broken up into four categories, and I'm sorry for giving you this kind of a lecture, but there's, they're color-coded on this um, interesting diagram here. You have production services, regulation services, cultural services, and support services. Um, the cultural services do sort of reach out into that other cultural area, but in the natural science side, production services are things we want directly, right? I want fish, I want water, I want food. Okay? Regulation services are essentially the things that help us get that stuff that we have a hard time monetizing because they're happening behind the scenes in nature somewhere. So that's water um, cleaning, um, 
You've got um, pollination services, pest control services. Nature is providing those things for us generally free of charge so long as we don't muck it up enough. Um, in some other people's language, this is, the, this is the language of the commons. And whether or not it becomes a tragedy of the commons depends on how wisely you manage that particular resource in that system. Then you have your cultural services, um, which we um, have a couple of them over here, health. Um, and recreation, um, things like that. And, they're, and they're, they're cultural, but they're related deeply to um, the, the, the physical, biophysical, scientific, because they're embedded in it. Health is something that you do on the biophysical body, and so science enters quite a bit, at least if you're doing it right. And then the support services are sort of even further removed from the regulatory systems. They're there. Without them being there, they're the base of the system. You can't get going. It's the soil. It's the nutrient cycling, right? These are nutrient cycling is a biophysical reality that nitrate turns to nitrite or ammonium under different conditions. Those are those are those are chemical laws. Um, but we're dependent on understanding and knowing them if we're going to um, understand this whole sustainability um, thing um, as it is. And so, why why am I telling you this, right? I'm not just telling you this so that you all become natural scientists. Physically and biologically, these are processes that operate on scales well beyond that of a villa estate. And so I think several of the speakers who've come before me have, have, have gotten to the idea that we're in a shift moment for a variety of reasons. Um, and part of the shift here is a shift from thinking about specific locations, from self-sustainability um, at a local lo level to larger, very complicated and interconnected systems. Um, um, agriculture, energy, water, sewage, waste, consumer products, these are all very dispersed, global, um, heterogeneous in space and time systems that are complicated and dynamic and changing. Um, and sustainability, we must now consider it on this level, um, and we need to reconsider the place of the villa within this kind of a networked landscape. So agricultural systems um, are really, really good examples of complex systems. And you're all supposed to memorize this graph right here. You'll need it later. <laughs> And I'm showing it to you merely to blow you away to say that there are people who visually think about these things. And these are, these are not designers, right? If this was designed, it would, if Chip did this, it would look way better. Uh, these, are, these are engineers, engineers and economists. And, um, but but they, they count and enumerate variables, and they take it pretty seriously. Not the best um, conversationalists, not the best dinner companions, but you want to make sure you get everything into account, they, they might give you half a shot. And, and I pull out the, the nitrogen cycle here, um, which relates very strongly to agriculture. You know, now most of the nitrogen fixation happening on the planet is, is due to um, artificial processes, um, specifically the Haber-Bosch reaction, which, converge, con which creates which takes um, inorganic nitrogen, or, or not inorganic, but um, uh, elemental nitrogen, N2, in the atmosphere, and converts it into a form of nitrogen that plants can utilize so that we can grow crops bigger, is the largest single driver of the, of the nitrogen system on the planet today. We have totally altered this biochemical pathway throughout the entire biosphere. And this is one piece of all the stuff that's going on um, in here. So I'm just trying to impress upon you, this is complex. Um, and it's a mix of these, these chemical and biological laws that are immutable. Um, that's what 300 years of empirical science has taught us. If you don't believe it, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> we, need, we need another conversation on that one. But, but this does come up. It does come up. Oh, boy, does it come up. Um, um, you know, are coupled with decision-making um, on, on human levels and needs. Um, we can make this look a little nicer. We can take the, that sort of picture and we can put it physically into a, a structure of, of, envir of, the, of the, 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 the sort of three prongs of, of sustainability, um, noting that we're talking specifically about farming and talk about the inputs and the outputs and the, um, and the, and the nature of those kinds of things. So, so agriculture is, a, is, I'm gonna use this as an example as many other people have because it relates historically to the concept of the villa. It's an integral part of the concept of the villa or the villa maybe derives you know, from agriculture as an enterprise that's taken on millennia, but it can be placed within this modern concept of sustainability. And let's make this easier and let's talk about a specific agricultural product. And let's talk about one that makes sense to talk about here and that's olives. Um, so a couple statistics, I'm sorry. Tuscany produces, I got these numbers, they're from 2008, I think. I'm sure there's better numbers somewhere than I have them, but they'll, they'll be good enough for the back of the, of, the, uh, of the envelope calculations that I've done. Tuscany produces about 18,000 tons of olive oil 
on about 97,000 hectares. Um, you divide that number and you get about 185 kilograms of olive oil per hectare of olive oil planted. That's average. Some great olive oil producers may get more, some mediocre and poor olive oil producers may get less. Um, or it may be a function of the quality of the soil or any of the other things that, that change in space. My back of the envelope, Nick, tell me if I'm right, you've got somewhere between 50 and 20 he hectares of olives at La Pietra, uh, about 2,000 trees. Um, if you're getting average yields um, for Tuscany, you produce about 3,700 kilograms of olive oil. Did you guys produce 3,700 kilograms of olive oil last year? Doesn't remember. <laughs> Zero. When I was here, we produced 3,700. <laughs> I think I picked 3,700 kilos worth of olives, but let, so that's enough. Now, also, I didn't put this up. Um, uh, Italians consume, oh, I didn't put it up. Italians consume on average 12 kilograms of olive oil per person, right? Not the highest. The Greeks consume more olive oil than the Italians by quite a bit, actually. Um, but certainly more than Americans. Um, and so at these rates, if you do the math, uh, Villa La Pietra can produce about enough olive oil per year for about 308 people. Now, that's interesting. That's about the number of prob you know, students and faculty and staff that work here. So for olive oil, Villa La Pietra may be fully sustainable. <laughs> Assuming we get no outside inputs for that olive oil and, and, and ignoring the frantoio, the, the mills and the bottles of, of, that we put them in and, and lots of other things. But, you know, hey, not bad. Um, good. You guys are ahead of Italy. Italy produces 17% of the world's um, olive oil, consumes 30%. Italy is not self-sufficient for, for olive oil. Anybody know who produces all the world's olive oil? Spain. Professor Agnoletti is one of the people um, of whom I, I met for the first time yesterday. He doesn't know that I have his book on my shelf at home. Um, it's an excellent, excellent book, The Italian Historical Rural Landscapes. And he does a series of case studies, and one of his case studies is the Hills of Fiesle that you can see from, from Villa La Pietra. Um, and he says, and this is, you know, I think really related to what he you know, said in his talk, and so I'll just quickly paraphrase it. But for many years now, um, in, the, in, the, in the Tuscan, the Fiesle environment, agriculture has become a secondary, almost marginal economic activity. We are confronted with a situation where the historic villa gardening has been extended to agriculture, which is hence practiced today as a means to preserve the landscape. So recognizing that the Tuscan villa really is not self-sufficient for the Italian population anymore for olive production, um, but it's the cultural value of that landscape that he so eloquently discussed earlier today that, that's, that's, that's meaningful. It's now being treated more as an extension of um, of the villa gardening than as an actual agricultural practice where people would derive income and, um, and try to maximize, and, uh, d depending on who you are, production relative to that agricultural product. But it's important, we've had a change. I mean, this is the point. We're all talking about that we're, at a, we're at a, really at a change point here. It is possible, if not probable, that the villa was closer to sustainable in previous times, right? So maybe we're sustainable with a lot of for olive oil right now, you are not sustainable with La Pietra for any other food product, certainly not for water cycles, certainly not for material cycles, certainly not for my, my, my you know, this, this wonderful apple product was not made here at Villa La Pietra. Um, and all of the associated environmental costs and, and trade-offs and other things that come along with all of these things that we're enjoying right now, um, they were produced somewhere um, and, and, and biophysical realities happened um, in their process, and, and, that, and that made some changes. And so it is possible, if not probable, that the villa was closer to sustainable in previous times when there were fewer people, made life easier, um, when people didn't use electricity, um, when uh, we lived in a much less connected world where I didn't know what they had in China, and so how could I possibly covet and want it and buy it? And, and I'm echoing, um, once again, something that was previously said. What we're really looking at is a story of demographic shifts. And, and the villa, and the agricultural environment itself didn't cause the demographic shift. The demographic shift happened. It happened for different reasons in different places. In the United States, it's very much a story about the need for labor to come off of farms um, to feed from rising industrial activity. In some cases, the people come off the farms in specific instances when, when, um, when labor is needed for war, and then when they come back, they don't go back to where they came from. There are a variety of reasons, um, but it happened. And the US is a great, extreme example of this, where if you start in 1840, 
70% of the workforce are agriculturalists. They're deriving their primary income from direct agriculture, not from the processing of agricultural goods, but from farming. Uh, we, have, we arrive at a point today where we're about 2% in the United States, and about a quarter of, a, of, of that 2%, so a half of 1%, are really producing 70 to 80% of our actual agricultural products and values. So even that 2% that that's farming, three quarters are part-time or hobby farmers. And at the same time, this is amazing. Uh, well, this is just from 1948, but at the same time, total agricultural output shoots up. Fewer and fewer and fewer people working on something and more and more and more of it being made. It's, it's, um, it's amazing. Good, bad, it's amazing. Um, interestingly, total farm inputs mostly stay flat. Now, this is a... Um, a conglomeration of statistics. Obviously, labor input goes way down. Um, chemical input goes way up, especially up until 76. And then we start getting a lot more um, judicious with the way we do chemicals. We still use them. But, um, and this is total, right? This is total. And then there's a disconnect, a big disconnect. Very few of us do agriculture. Very few. I don't. I sit in an office most of my, most of my day. More than 50% of the United States is agricultural production land. More than 50%, if you include grazing lands. Even if you don't include grazing lands, it's close to, it's a little over 20%. It's going down slightly, ever so slightly. It's sort of a, a mini version of what we heard earlier about reforestation um, here in Tuscany. There's similar, heavily reafo good re reforestation in the northeastern United States and still some expansion of croplands in other parts of the country. Urban lands, we're about 4% right now, urban lands. And 80% of us live in the urban environment. We're completely disconnected from these systems. We don't see them. We don't know the people who work in them. If we do meet the people who work in them, we're much more likely to meet that three quarters that are doing it as a hobby or, or, or part-time, that they need to derive some of their income off-farm as well, in fact, the majority of it. So this is fascinating. This is a big change in a relatively short period of time. So what does this have to do with Tuscan villas and consideration of them for contemporary sustainability? We come to these environments, we come here, we look out the window, we don't, I don't even need to put slides up, we should be looking out the window. Um, and we're all, uh, we're all viscerally affected, or most of us are. Um, I have a feeling that all the people in this room probably are, otherwise you probably wouldn't have chosen to come to this particular. But the vast majority of the agriculture in, in, in the developed world, all right, in Europe and the United States, um, and increasingly in, in the developing countries, the so-called BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, looks like this. And they, have very, they, they appear to have very little in common. And I would argue that in looking at this, if you don't look hard enough and see this, then you're not looking. And so we've come to a point where one of the best values of this landscape is by looking at it and valuing it and thinking about it, you achieve awareness of this hidden landscape, or at least a romanticized landscape. For me, on a personal level, I came from a farming community, so I understood farming even though I didn't do it. So it wasn't hard to see past this into, into this. But with 80% of the folks, at least in the United States, and similar numbers in Italy being urbanized and not having very much access, if any access, to actual urban landscapes, then how do people make those connections? It's really hard to do. We instinctively feel positive about this landscape for good reason. It's got a lot of cultural value to it. It's indoctrinated. And also, it's pretty healthy. There's not that much danger in here for us. There's a lot of good things for us as well. Um, but the tension can be positive. It can be very, very positive because it's forcing us to think about these two things which we want to very quickly put on to antagonistic paths and begin to drill down a little bit more into what those things really mean. And so for me, um, thinking about La Pietra and what sustainability may have meant years ago, maybe as, as little as 60, 70 years ago, but certainly hundreds of years ago to the, the community that occupied the villa space then versus what does sustainability mean to us now and what are the systems that are invisible to us on a daily basis that are actually supporting the lifestyle that we lead even though we're occupying this space here. And so through this process, we're forced 
I hope, I hope to force you to see the changing relationship between humans and our agricultural environs since the Renaissance, which is primarily a story of demographics. This is the story in the United States. In 1850, all the people were in these locations and there weren't that many of them. Um, in 1850, the percent of land and farms looked like this. So the red are, are counties where between 80 and 100% of the land was farmed actively and below, and then as, it gets, as the colors get cooler, it's less and less of that. By 1990, the populations have, have really, have spread, but they've spread mostly on the coasts, mostly in the, the you know, sort of major cities, industrialized cities around the Midwest and, and South and, and, and all of South Florida, and the farms are here. Now they're here. This whole giant swath of red, and then this little central piece of California that everybody dri either drives through or flies over, um, those are 80 to 100% farm. These are these areas. Those are the places where we're not. I, have I driven this point home enough yet? I don't know. So, so we're at a crossroads. We're at a crossroads. We have disconnected ourselves from t 1,000 years, 10,000 years of a way of doing things. We had good reasons. We had good reasons. We didn't always do it wisely, but there were reasons for why we do it. Um, and the question then becomes, well, what are we going to do now that we're at the crossroads? And how are we going to see these two systems? It's very tempting to create a false dichotomy. It's very tempting to say that, 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 that this agricultural landscape here, which is here, um, is, is sustainable currently. Right? Or recognize that it was sustainable in the past. And so either seek to go back to the sustainable version of it or seek to adapt it to a new model of sustainability. And I think it's no, it's no, it's no coincidence that the slow food movement has developed primarily in Italy and then, or did develop in Italy and then was exported to other countries, which really seeks to take some of the ethos of some of the traditional methods of Italian agriculture, um, uh, pit them against the concept of sort of fast processed food, and and, and, and espouse that as a solution to agricultural problems. On the other hand, the industrialized system of agriculture that we have here, um, and which is very, very complex in its scope and breadth, is really driven by demographic concerns. Um, it's driven, first of all, by just movement of people, even before, let's say, the Earth's carrying capacity was necessarily a big challenge, so just local carrying capacity issues. In other words, if we all live in New York City, we can't all have farms in New York City. It just doesn't work that way. So somewhere else the farms have to be. Um, but now we've got that problem on a very serious global scale. And so you can sort of think of these things as two separate tracks with two necessarily different conclusions. Um, but I don't actually think that that's true. Um, I think that... that in fact, um, these are compatible concepts, and then if we follow sustainability um, in a very scientific and, and, and empirically results and goal-oriented way, we'll find that, that, that those two systems are converging. Part of our problem is semantic. What do we call this most of the time? Conventional agriculture. This is conventional agriculture. And what's this? Alternative agriculture. Well. If all of a sudden, half of the corn farms in the U.S. decide to plant olives on them, then having a half olive, half corn farm would be conventional agriculture. Conventional just means prevailing practice. Alternative just means what's not that. And so we've established a semantic system that will not allow us to progress. We're, what's prevailing is always going to be conventional. What's not prevailing is always going to be alternative. That's a, that's a, you, know, you broke rule number one of getting things done, which is set realistic goals. Um, so, so, so there does need to be a semantic correction. And um, it's beginning to happen. Um, and it's fascinating because uh, essentially through systems thinking, systems thinking ends up being the way that you have to conceive of these really complex systems. Um, you're starting to have people on the one hand coming from the, the, the diversification side, taking clues from villa landscapes, from, from sustainable alternative landscapes, you know, whether it's in um, an Italian context or here's a, a mixed perennial system in a tropical context, um, and thinking about how do you maximize them for productivity while maximizing them for, um, for, the, for, for, for caloric consumption, for, for, um, 
for diversity and proper balance of nutrition, for economic activity for the folks that are there, and for the space and time to still pursue the really important things that people love to do that, that aren't just feeding ourselves, like listening to music and writing poetry and seeing movies, especially blockbusters. And on the other side, you're having what's something called sustainable intensification kind of pop up. And this is not a European concept, but it's being embraced by Europe as well. And it's a recognition that there's also a cost to ex extensifying, re-extensifying agriculture. If agriculture is very productive on a monocrop level in one place, if you switch to a system that's less productive, then that means you have to expand agricultural production area in order to achieve the same yield, and you've lost something somewhere else. And so it's being honest about that, and it sets a very specific goal of saying, at least let's not expand agriculture any further. Let's keep the agri agricultural footprint we currently have, maybe even try to winnow it down a little bit more, and while we feed an additional three to four billion mouths over the next 50 years in this process, let's also decrease the inputs on a per unit basis, both per hectare, per area, and per unit production, whatever the agricultural system happens to be. So, good, good. And hopefully you can see that these things are not, not incompatible, and I'll be happy to give you a good example of how they're not incompatible later. Well, I don't, we'll see. But, I look at all, amongst you all, and partially you all just had a really good meal, but partially you're all really bored because I showed you numbers. I showed you complex diagrams that you couldn't read the details of from where you are, which is a no-no. I broke a lot of rules. And, and William McDonough, who was a, a designer, um, who's really one of the great thinkers, he wrote a book called Cradle to Grave um, um, in Sustainability, um, pointed out, why would you ever want to have a sustainable marriage? If I said to you, hey, you got married last year, how's it going? Sustainable. You know, I might get nervous. <laughs> or if I, if I liked your ex-fiance, I might be thrilled. Um, but, um, you know, clearly we can aspire to more than that. So this, the language of sustainability that we use is just not exciting. It's not sexy. It's not um, invigorating and, and, and hopeful. And no matter how enlightened we may get in terms of regulations coming from the U.S. Department of Agriculture or from the European Commission or the Italian um, 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 Agriculture Department, um, they're unlikely to, to speak to us in a deep and visceral way. And so, and so that's a problem. And so Italian villas offer another avenue of real inspiration, at least for me, and that's that there was this idea. Remember, um, Serini talked about it and others talked about it you know, during the Renaissance, that the villa was a place of utility, but also a place of pleasure. And the utility was not conceived of in a, in a purely industrial sense. It wasn't just utility for production of, of food or products or anything like that. It was utility of spirit, utility of thought. Um, we saw a lot of great pictures earlier in the day. Um, uh, Chip was talking about the, the act of, of thinkers, of politicians, spending time in these places, having the microclimates being proper to be conducive towards the decision making and the processes that they needed to be good leaders, to be good business folk, to be whatever it was that they really needed to be. They recognized that value. And so the existence of the villa um, and its stewardship and continual restoration and rebirth is important. Um, and I think there's no better example of that than the, than the, the Teatrino, the, 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 the green verdant theater, uh, the other kind of green verdant um, theater you know, that exists here at Villa La Pietra, a, a whimsical place designed for the showcasing of the arts. Um, that's important. And so, in conclusion, um, for me, there are two important paths of inspiration that are very, very different um, and that La Pietra has helped me realize. The first is a recognition that behind the bucolic, idyllic landscape uh, that we can convince ourselves is sustainable on some level lie much, much larger systems that allow our current lives to be possible and that we are not very close, most of us at least. There are a few that manage, but most, most, most people are not in a position to be switching quickly over to a tightly local sustainability model. That's just not very in the cards with the 80% of the, of the US urbanized. The, the world is about 60% urbanized right now and it's getting higher and higher. That's the one piece. The second piece is to remind us that there are greater goods and value beyond survival. That the enduring legacy of these places as designed spaces, right, are, are, are nourishing you know, for our souls. And so if we succeed in 
clothing and feeding ourselves and providing material goods that we want to sate our appetites, if that's even possible, we will not be done. Um, and the villa as, as a, is a living, really is a living monument and testament for me for both of those things. So I'm very happy to end there and I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has. I guess I'm sort of thinking about my question, but I don't want you to leave yet. So I'm like, but, 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 but. Um, I'm really impressed with how uh, you tied these concepts together. And then as soon as you put that word tension up there in that earlier image, I just thought, oh my gosh, that's it, right? And um, I don't really have a question. I mean, I wish you had the answer <laughs> to our, our problem here. Um, I, guess my, I guess my question would be, and I, I see, you know, you, like the conclusion or uh, the way we're, we're coming out of this or we're, or we're at this crossroads, but did you, do you have an idea of, you know, what you would it suggest for people to do or what, what people can do themselves? And I'm not saying, oh, like, let's save the world and recycle, mm -hmm. but, you know, truly, when, when Kim Wilkie mentioned the farming idea and just looking from slow food to, uh, when you put that slide up and you said, what's this called? I said, I was just about to yell out spray and pray, you know, agriculture. <laughs> um, but I mean, do, you know, I, that would be my question. Do you have, you know, in this conclusion, a, a path for people to no. take. No, no, <laughs> um, But that's because that's it's not my really job. It's really depressing. That's not, it's, that's not my job. So <laughs> no, I know. my job is, uh, but I have, an answer to, I have an answer to your question, but I don't have an answer to the problem. Oh, okay. <laughs> Be, oh. And the other thing I'll say is beware of snake oil salesmen. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, this, these are, these are, there's a term for this, right? The, the, in in the, the sociological literature now, they call these wicked problems, right? Um, wicked, wicked problems. There are, there are a handful of wicked problems in the world, climate change, agricultural production, and they're very discussed in the, in the scholarly literature as wicked problems. And wicked problems have a, it's enumerated what makes a problem wicked, that the policy solutions are intractable for a variety of reasons, and blah, 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 blah. So they're just really hard problems, and, we, and we're beginning to, to describe that. Um, I, I'm an educator. My job, I run an institution whose mission is to educate the public. I'm, I'm, I'm a part-time researcher as well. I do that mainly for fun. Um, but my job, I don't get paid to do research. Where I see the problem that I can fix, at least with my particular set of skills, is that the public doesn't understand agriculture, the reality of agriculture. Most people um, do look at this and say bad. And they look at this and say good. Well fine, but you depend on that way more than you depend on that. This, this, is, this is producing, um, even in Europe, where there are tremendous subsidies for organic and sustainable agriculture, I think you're at 14%. Um, it, it's, is it maybe even lower? For organic? For organic in the all of EU? Well, I know that the general uh, value of organic is probably subsidized by just 30%. But what percentage of actual agricultural production ends up being organic in the, in the, in the it's pretty low, and, and, it, and there's a, and you see, 30, but it's 30% subsidized. So, I mean, it tells you there's something going on. In the US, where we don't have really much organic subsidy, um, but you do have a price premium and you've got a market, and you have people who want to vote with their dollar, we're at about 4% organic. Uh, and that's by value. By, by, by land area, it's much less because it's typically high value products that go for organic. So, yes, you know, vote, vote with your dollars if you want to, but I think that there's a limited capacity to really solve this by voting with your dollars. These are, these are entrenched um, um, bi biophysical first and then socio-political problems. Um, you can't think your way into a world where nitrogen behaves differently than nitrogen behaves. So um, those are, you know, really you know, recognizing the biophysical realities of the system is key. And so the point that I was going to make is that we lack currently education on this topic at any level. And as a, as a director of, a, of, of the most visited public garden in the United States, um, I have 1.3 million people walking through my doors every day, every day, I wish, every year, to learn about plants. They're coming to learn about plants or to be healed by plants in some capacity. They're, they're attracted to the facility. It's free and it has clean bathrooms and then we use, and we use that as a tool to get them into. But, um, but we're not teaching them about agriculture. And we're certainly, when we do teach them about agriculture, we kind of go, there's a tomato plant, there's a corn plant, you know? Um, we certainly don't explain to them what the, what the context of agricultural production is in the country. Who knew, who, how many people here knew that in the United States, over 50% of the land use is agricultural? Anybody know that? Should, shouldn't you know that? 
It's kind of like me saying, you know, you all know a quarter of the budget in the federal budget in the U.S. goes to the military, right? Everybody knows that, <laughs> right? We have terms for that military industrial complex, right? You should know half of the, of the, of the, of the land is in agricultural production. Uh, that's a really good question. It may, it may not. It may, it may be, you know, arable land. Does it include Alaska? Does it include, and, and there's a couple of, you know, the U.S. is a little particular as well. Timber harvest is considered agriculture in the U.S. as well. And, um, and the Department of Agriculture in the U.S. manages the national forests, and they are much, much more vast than the national parks. So it could if they, if they did that, but I'd have to drill down on that number. That's very important. But the crop number is key. Even just that this is this, this. That's 20% of the service of the United States. Uh, this is corn, so 98% of corn in the U.S. is GM. So most likely, but I'm not 100% sure.